All right. Well, um, I hope everybody's doing well. I just got my electricity back last night. Still no internet, but um, I think gradually things are going to get sorted out, and hopefully the worst is behind us. Now, that's not the right date. This is all completely jumbled up. Well, we'll, we'll start without an announcement slide today. <laughs> Let me just show you the, uh, the revised course schedule, and that will be the basis for our discussion of the announcements. All right, so um, homework four you've had on your plate for a long time. That's the, uh, the nodal method assignment. And uh, so we pushed that back a couple of times. And now that we're back to having classes and the university is in session, the deadline for that assignment four is going to be on Wednesday. So you've got two more days to finish that or you know, reach out and ask me questions if you have any. Um, and then uh, homework five, which is related to Hardy Cross, that's going to be due a week from today. So I hope and I think that that's probably much, much more time than anybody's going to need to uh, finish up that assignment. But uh, just to be as generous as possible, I thought that a Monday deadline for homework five would be uh, reasonable. And uh, so essentially with these two days of class meetings that were canceled, that shifts the entire semester downward. And I wanted to give you an overview of uh, what the impacts of that are going to be. Uh, the first thing that's really important uh, that's changed is the date of our first midterm exam. And the midterm originally was going to be um, on Wednesday, March 3rd. So that exam was supposed to be Wednesday of this week. Um, but instead, we're going to have it next Monday. Um, so that's been delayed by two days. Um, everything else has kind of shifted downward in terms of the due dates of assignments. And um, I did eliminate one of the assignments from the semester. If you looked at our earlier class meeting, we were going to have through 13 assignments. Uh, but because of the delays and the subjects we're not going to be able to cover, what that means is then it's going to just be shortened to 12 assignments. Um, some of the deadlines remain the same, though, uh, specifically related to the final uh, submission for the design project. That's still going to be due on Monday, the 19th of April. And uh, I think you're going to have plenty of time to work on that. The uh, design project is going to be uh, assigned next week on Friday. So you'll receive the project on March 5th, and then it's not going to be due until April 19th. The entirety of that design project is related to, op uh, to closed uh, conduit flow. And so there isn't going to be any more material you're receiving related to that course after uh, that topic and after uh, Wednesday of next week, at which point we're going to move on to open channel flow. And there's no open channel flow in the project. So the topic that was axed was sewer design. Um, at the end, uh, lectures 49, uh, 39 and 40 was going to be sewer design, which is just kind of a specialized case of open channel flow because circular uh, because of circular open channel uh, sewer pipe. It's just the geometry makes things a little bit tricky. So you won't get that, uh, not this semester anyway. Uh, Logan asks uh, to be curious of those lectures still on YouTube. Yes, they are. And I'd be glad to have you uh, learn a little bit about um, open channel hydraulics with a circular conduit. If you want to go to those lectures, I'll I can give you, I'll put the link in Blackboard in case you want to go to that. But unfortunately, cancellations have consequences, and yours is that you don't get to spend two class meetings thinking about sewers. <laughs> okay. Uh, one other announcement I wanted to let you know about is Friday of this week, the class meeting is going to be online. Uh, unfortunately, I have a uh, graduate council meeting at that same day and time, and I skipped a graduate council last month so that we could have a live class meeting. But if I skip any more graduate council meetings, they'll kick me off the graduate council. So I have to pre-record that class meeting. And so uh, I, I guess if there's anything worse than a live virtual class, it's a recorded virtual class. But that's all you're going to get on Friday. So I wanted to let you know in advance. And when that recording is available, I'll send you the email link uh, for this Friday's class. We'll have our normal live virtual class on Wednesday. 
Okay, so I've sent you an email. This schedule is now posted on Blackboard. Are there any questions related to the announcements? Oh, Luke had a question uh, that I didn't notice earlier. How, uh, can you explain how the exam is going to be formatted and given? Sure. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about exam one. Um, our class meets from 1 to 150. So what I'm going to do on Monday, March 8th at 1230, the exam will suddenly appear on Blackboard as a PDF file. Uh, you can download that and print it out or you can just have it on your screen. You don't necessarily have to print it. But the exam will be open from 1130 until um, 230. No, wait, hold on. From 12.30 to 2.30. So it's a two-hour window that straddles 30 minutes on either side of our class meeting. So our class goes essentially from 1 to 2. So you're going to have that 1 to 2 time plus 30 minutes on either side. Now, the length of the exam, I'm going to be writing it uh, to be the same 50-minute exam that I give in a normal semester. And a 50-minute exam, what that really means is that uh, you know a handful of speed racers are probably going to finish the test in 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, the majority of the class will finish up in 40 to 50 minutes. And there's always going to be a handful of people for whom uh, no amount of time ever is enough. And, uh, and so 50 minutes wouldn't be enough in a normal semester, and two hours won't feel like enough in this semester. So uh, that's just the way things are. But uh, you'll have two hours, essentially, 120 minutes to do what I'm going to consider is a 50-minute exam. Gavin asks, is it going to have those iterative Excel problems on it? Um, I'll speak to the specific coverage of the exam a little bit later. We still have uh, several more days to figure that specific detail out. But uh, yeah, I have had pretty detailed Excel problems on previous exams, whether it's Hardy Cross method or whether it's the three reservoirs. Uh, there is a, a good possibility that you'll have a problem on the test that requires you to use Excel. Harrison asks, have we had a class yet that you've taken account of people with cameras and mics for the extra credit that you mentioned in our first class? Um, I have the, uh, the reports on, uh, on Blackboard that I can go back and look at the attendance. What I've learned in the meantime is that there's no easy way when we have as many people as we do in a class for me to look at everyone's webcam at once. I can only see a couple of webcams at a time. I can't look at everybody's. And so the, uh, those points are just going to be on the basis of attendance. And I'm going to go back and look at uh, one of the class meetings that we had earlier in the semester for our first one. So like before all the weather delays and everything, what I'll probably do is look at uh, sometime in week three and use that as the first attendance bonus points day. Any other questions before we continue our uh, Hardy Cross example? You know, if you do have uh, follow-up questions, you can send me an email or call me on Teams or on the phone. And uh, what I wondered is maybe there are uh, some people who don't necessarily know how to place a call on Teams. And so just really quickly, let me show you how you can do that. If you've got Microsoft Teams, you can type a name here into the search bar. And it will bring up, and that search bar is across the top no matter what tab you're in on the left. And so, uh, for instance, if I wanted to uh, place a call to, uh, to the dean, uh, I'd start taping, typing in his last name, D-A-M-P. And uh, there he is. So there's the dean. And then when you click on him, I'd have the option to either place an audio call or a video call. And all you got to do is click the name, and it'll start ringing through on my end and give me the chance to, to answer it. If you ever see, like, if it says, like, red, like, busy, go ahead and call anyway, because sometimes it shows busy even if I'm just, um, like, in an appointment where, you know, it's like one of those virtual meetings where I'm in with a dozen other people, and I could probably cancel out of that to answer your question. So call me even if it says I'm busy. And, you know, if I can't pick up, I won't. But I'd love to have your calls on Teams because the advantage with that compared to just sending me an email is it's so much easier for me to understand what your real question is if you explain it to me than if I'm reading what you typed uh, because I can ask follow-up questions, 
you can share screen with me and show me what you've already tried, maybe on the spreadsheet. If you have a, a problem, you just can't figure out why the solution isn't converging, well, you can share your screen with me, and I'm pretty good at this point of finding mistakes in like Hardy Cross spreadsheets, for example. Uh, so it's just so much easier than getting the point to get the point across with a live call than it is with uh, an email. So you know, feel free and reach out, and I'll even answer in the evening on my cell phone uh, because I've got Teams on my phone. Uh, if I'm available, I'd love to hear from you. So, all right, well, let's move on. Uh, unless there are any other questions. This is where we left things last time we had class. And frankly, what was that, Monday, a week ago? <laughs> it's hard to even remember. So much crazy stuff has happened in the meantime. All right, so where we left off last time was we were working on this example where we had two loops. And uh, what we knew was the water's coming in at this control point, junction A. Um, through the iterative process that's described in uh, the video for last Monday's class, we had done a flow balance where we're looking at at each junction is in equal to out and we're applying some energy balancing relationships that looks at are you having the same flow uh, regardless of which route you take to get to a junction. And uh, in the end, we did this iter we set it up so that we could copy and paste subsequent iterations. And so it took a while to set up iteration one, and it took a while to transfer some of those formulas over for iteration two. But then in the, uh, the follow-up iterations after that, it was pretty easy because we just copied and pasted. All right. So where we had left off last time was we had calculated the flow rate at each of the junctions. Um, and we had seen that there wasn't much of a change anymore between the original flow rate coming into the iteration and the flow rate coming out of the iteration. The biggest percent change was this pipe BC where there's just not very much flow. But still, even after just four iterations, we were down to 1% change. And so that suggests we've got convergence. And the other good clue we have that the solution is converging is by looking at the F values from iteration to iteration. You'll notice that the F value in iteration 3 is pretty close to the F value in iteration 4. Just uh, for all the pipes, except for this one where there's not very much flow, that changed a little. Not a ton, a little. But the rest of these are pretty much stabilized. And so those are the two indicators of convergence. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We know the flow rates. Now, I'd like to calculate how much head loss is there through each pipe. So pipe AB, what do we know about it? We know the diameter of that pipe is 500 millimeters. We know the length of that pipe is 220 meters. We know the flow rate that's going through it. And so all of the things that we'd need to calculate the head loss is available. And we could apply the, uh, the Darcy-Wiesbach equation, FLV squared divided by D2G. That's the, the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. Or there's a version of that equation that says FLQ squared divided by D2GA squared. But what you'll remember is that here, the head loss is just our R value times Q to the power of N. So maybe that's easiest of all. So head loss in these, we're just only accounting for the friction losses. There's no local losses. It's the R value that we've calculated times the flow rate. And we'll use this output corrected flow rate. So flow rate to the power of N. OK, so that's how much head loss is going through pipe AB. And we can drag the formula down and find out the head loss through each pipe. And it's a good practice to double check those common pipes. Like, for example, CE. Do we get the same head loss in perspective of loop 1, 1 1.71, as we do in loop 2? Yeah. So the head loss is the same there, regardless of whether we're looking at it from the perspective of loop 1 or loop 2. And then the, uh, the head loss for EF, same thing, 0 0.43, 0 0.43. All right, so 
here I've updated my sketch. Uh, originally, I had just my guess values. And if we go back to the guess values that were applied, did I have a sketch that just should, oh, I might. Um, I think I had it on a different, on a different version of that drawing. Well, I had some original guess values. These are the final flow rates. And there, the, the direction of flow is going to be important for calculating what is the pressure at each junction. And I'll show you why. Uh, the pressure at junction A is known. That's our control point. So we know that it's 600 kPa. And we could calculate the head there. The head is going to be the pressure divided by gamma. Okay, So equals pressure divided by and the unit weight of water in terms of kilonewtons per cubic meter is 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. So there's 61.16 meters of head at junction A. Everywhere else is going to be based on the amount of head that there is in the system at junction A. So location B is going to have less head than A. By definition, the water is flowing from A to B, so there's going to be a loss in the pipe. As you flow from A to B, there's energy being lost. How much energy? 3.49 meters of energy. Okay, so the, uh, the head at B will be the head that there was at A minus the loss between A and B. So now that tells me how much head there is at B. And then the pressure at B is that head multiplied by 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. Okay, So that will then give me kilonewtons per meter squared, which is kPa. All right, so that's how much pressure there is at B. Now what about junction C? Is there going to be more pressure or less pressure at C than there is compared to B? Well, there has to be more at C because that's what's driving the flow from C towards B. In this example, all of these junctions are at the same elevation. There's no elevation differences. And so if there's a pressure difference, it's because there's a head difference there. Okay, so the head at C is going to be however much there was at B plus the change. So we look at how much head loss there was between B and C. Uh, not much. That's that pipe that has very little flow. It looks like it's 0 .001 meter of head. So that's a pretty minuscule change. There's just simply not much flow through that pipe. Okay, so then the pressure, we can drag that formula down because it's just looking at the head multiplying it by gamma. So effectively the same pressure if we look at it just to the nearest tenth of a kPa. All right, now what about D? Again, looking at the final direction of flow, there has to be more pressure at D than there is at C. So the head at D would be the head at C plus the loss between pipes C and D, a junction C and D. So I'm going to add in the loss. Okay, so now we can again calculate the pressure just by dragging down this formula that's multiplying the head by gamma. I get slightly more head that D. Now we've been adding things. Now look at from D towards F. So in the direction of flow, you lose head. So if you're going from D, there's more pressure at D than there is at F, and that's why the flow is going from D towards F in a horizontal pipe, is because it's going towards the low point in pressure. Okay, so um, pipe F is the head at D minus the loss through pipe DF. And so here's the loss between those two junctions. And then therefore the head is going to be however much uh, the pressure is going to be however much head there is multiplied by 9.A1 kilonewtons per cubic meter. 
And now finally, junction E. There's two ways we could do it. We could find junction E by saying it is however much pressure there is at C minus the loss through there. Or we could do it, it's however much there is at F minus the loss through EF. Let's just go with the uh, from F to E one. It would be the same either way. You could do it either way. It'll be the same. So it's the head at F minus the loss through EF. Okay. And then the pressure, we would just drag the same formula down. And so now what we've got is for each junction, we know the pressure, we know the flow through each pipe, and we've basically solved the flow situation in this complicated network using the iterative me method of the, uh, the Hardy Cross approach. I think I said last Monday when we had our class meeting that this is one that really kind of breaks my heart that we're not in the same classroom together because uh, I know somebody, if not many people, have just a tiny little mistake in the, uh, in the spreadsheet and it's not working because of that tiny mistake. And it's just so frustrating when you know, you're looking at my solution and yours is different and you can't figure out why. I'll remind you what some of the common errors are. Some of the common errors are that you should always use the most recently updated guess of the flow rate. And so we were using guess flow rates in the first loop, but then when we moved over to the second loop, two of these pipes are in common, CE and EF. And so for CE and EF, we weren't using our initial guess. We were using the, uh, the minus of the flow rate from the, other, uh, from the other loop. So for example, here for CE, you'll notice my formula is I'm just referring to this other guess for CE, but I've got the minus sign because when you switch bet from one loop to the other, then the flow direction perspective is different. And then same thing here for EF. Since that's a common pipe that exists both in loop one and loop two, I needed to say equals minus. And so I'd say that's probably the most common mistake is people not updating the flow rates to the most recent guess. All right, so if you have specific questions about that, I invite you to reach out. I would love nothing more, honestly, than debugging a Hardy Cross spreadsheet with you. It sounds crazy, but I just kind of like it. So let me know if you need help. But let's move on. Um, what we're going to do is take a look at two Hayes and Williams practice problems. And I, I added these in a couple of semesters ago when uh, on a final exam it was clear to me that I hadn't spent enough time reinforcing the Hayes and Williams equation. And uh, I think the, uh, you're going to get plenty of practice with Darcy Wiesbach, which is the most accurate method. But Hayes and Williams is more likely to come up on the FE exam. Just because the FE exam, those questions have to be like three or four minutes long. And you can do a Hayes and Williams problem in three or four minutes. It's a lot more difficult to do a Darcy Wiesbach problem in three or four minutes. Just because, you know, of the iterative process of finding F and so on. So I emailed you two questions at the beginning of class. If you'd like to print them out, that's great. If not, um, just take a screenshot of this slide. And let's see, do I, do I have some other formula that I also gave you here? These two. So, uh, oh yeah, I know what I was doing. I was trying to make it a little more confusing of exactly which formula you'd need for each. So I gave you both just so that you'd have to guess or figure out which formula to use. So this first problem is SI units. The second problem is in traditional BG, British gravitational units. So let's see, you've got the F formula. So let's look at the V formula for British gravitational. There it is. All right. So if you don't have this printed out or pulled up on a separate screen, uh, you push the print screen button right now on your computer, and then you can paste it into Paint or whatever image editor you like. You could paste it into a Word document. But um, I'm going to put you into those breakout rooms. And rather than listening to me talk or just complete silence, uh, I'd like you to collaborate together and uh, figure out 
in this case one, it's blowing through a horizontal pipe. We know the diameter. We know the pressure measurements, 75 meters apart. So we know how much the pressure is upstream and the pressure downstream. And we want to know what's going to be the flow rate if you've got that driving force of the pressure difference between the two points. Okay, so that's the first problem. And um, let me bring you back from the breakout rooms in 10 minutes and we'll go through that first problem together and make sure that we're all on the same page. If you finish early, feel free to get started on problem two, but uh, I'll put you into separate breakout rooms uh, in a bit to, to work on problem two. But for now, let's just do this first problem one and get some additional practice with the Hayes and Williams equation. So sending you to breakout rooms now. 